Hello, I'm Dr. Abdul Siddiqui, and I would like to talk today about LGBT plus health and the NHS. And I'd like to thank the Royal College of General Practitioners for inviting me to speak during the Pride Festival. And I'll try and focus some of this presentation around the evidence of these issues in primary care. So who am I? I'm an anaesthetic doctor working for the NHS in Northwest London. I'm also part of the management committee for the education charity Schools Out UK. Um, and that's how I really started becoming interested in LGBT health. Um, I'm not an expert in the area by any means, but I'm trying to get as much information as I can and I'm open to feedback and comments um, on this vast topic. Um, I've presented this at the Outing the Past Festival um, in February and tried to adjust it to include some information about primary care services and um, make it as relevant as possible to today's uh, talks. I'm not representing any organization in this talk. I don't have any vested interests. So to start off um, with the kind of beginnings of the NHS, um, the NHS was created on the 5th of July 1948, by um, inaugurated by the health minister and father of the NHS, Anurin Bevan. Um, this is the first NHS hospital um, on the right there, Park Hospital in Manchester, which is now the Trafford General Hospital. And the NHS was, you know, started on the concept that it would be funded from general taxation and free at the point of service. And over 70 years on, the, those founding principles remain. But what has the involvement of the LGBT plus community been in this period? So to start back in the 1950s, this is a picture of Alan Turing on the right. So he was one of the most influential code breakers in World War II and many would say the father of modern computing. Um, in 1952, he was convicted of sexual offenses with men. Now this was under the same gross indecency law that sent Oscar Wilde to prison in 1895. Now he was later pardoned in 2013 after his death, but at the time he was given the offer of either undergoing hormone treatment with chemical castration or going to prison and he chose to undergo the hormonal therapy. And this involved receiving monthly injections at Manchester Royal Infirmary with a drug containing the female hormone estrogen. And this was thought to inhibit his sex drive. This is one of the first really influential characters that we have in our history that underwent this therapy. In terms of other treatments for homosexuality that have been documented throughout the history of the NHS, um, a number of different treatments, especially psychological interventions, have been administered. And these have included psychoanalysis, religious counseling, and even electroconvulsive therapy. Now, in 2004, the British Medical Journal interviewed 29 people who had received treatments to change their sexual orientation in the UK and to relatives of patients. And through their work, they showed that no participant showed any benefits. And for most people, it actually reinforced their emotional isolation and shame. Now, interestingly, um, the evidence showed that patients either sought treatment for themselves or were refer referred after discussion with healthcare professionals, including GPs and also teachers, um, or as an alternative to imprisonment. They then went on to look at 28 uh, healthcare workers that had been involved in administering these treatments. And this included psychiatrists, psychologists, nurse specialists, and even an electrician who was involved in developing electric shock equipment. And all of these people mentioned that they felt that the treatments were experimental in nature with scant regard for efficacy or ethics. Um, aversion therapy they mentioned in this paper with electric shocks was the most common form of treatment um, and treatments varied throughout the country with no protocol or ethical guidelines. So how about the picture now? Well, in 1993, the UK government finally removed homosexuality from its list of psychiatric disorders in England and Wales. Um, and this happened with the Scottish government in the year 2000. 
And in 2014, the Royal College of Psychiatrists made the statement that there was no sound scientific evidence that sexual orientation could be changed. Now, despite all of this, it's still not illegal in the UK um, to undergo conversion therapy for sexual orientation. However, it has been a point of action in the government's LGBT action plan that we'll go on to talk about later. And most recently this year, the government announced plans to legislate the banning of conversion therapy, um, although this hasn't um, gone through as of yet. So moving on to the 1960s, a common poll at the time showed that 93% of people in 1965 still saw homosexuality as a form of illness requiring medical treatment. Now that's just to give an idea of um, popular opinion at the time. And in 1966, the UK's first NHS gender clinic opened, and we'll go on to talk about that in the next slide. Um, in 1967, the Sexual Offences Act of 1967 um, finally legalized homosexual acts in over 21s um, on the condition that they were consensual in private and between two men, and it only applied to England and Wales. To talk a little bit more about the history of transgender health in the UK, um, we'll start after the inauguration of the NHS in 1951, where Sir Harold Gillies, the renowned plastic surgeon, performed the UK's first recorded male to female gender confirmation surgery on UK trans person Roberta Cow. Now, if we go before the inauguration of the NHS to 1946, that is when Sir Gillies actually performed the first sex reassignment female to male surgery on Michael Dillon. Now he's pictured here on the right, and he was one of the five faces picked for LGBT History Month this year. Um, and so I think it's important to include him in this talk. So in 1966, the German American endocrinologist, Harry Benjamin published the first major textbook um, called The Transsexual Phenomenon. And he argued for the acceptance of sex change surgery and trained a group of psychiatrists and psychotherapists in the treatment of transsexual people, which was the term at the time. Now to focus in a little bit more on the gender identity clinic that we mentioned earlier, um, the former head of research at the UK Gender Identity Clinic in Charing Cross that was um, started in 1966 also trained with Benjamin. And this is the first UK NHS gender service um, and still the largest gender clinic in the UK. And in 1979, the public became quite aware of this um, in the British documentary, A Change of Sex that was aired on the BBC. This showed the social and medical transition of Julia Grant and for the first time changed the way that people really viewed transgender people and over 9 million viewers watched the first episode of the show. Since this time, more than 130,000 people have changed social gender role in the UK. And in 1989, the first equivalent gender identity clinic for children opened at the Tavistock Centre in North London. And that's been particularly um, controversial at the moment. And we'll go on to talk a little bit about that. So in terms of legislation, the gender reassignment surgery was only made a legal right on the NHS in 1999. And it wasn't until 2004 that the UK Gender Recognition Act became law and gave trans people full legal recognition of their change in gender. Although it included a number of requirements, including requiring a mental health diagnosis of gender dysphoria. In 2019, the World Health Organization finally declassified transgender health issues as a mental illness. And as I mentioned earlier, in December 2020, um, a high court judgment was made on access to puberty blockers and the NHS amended its service specification for gender identity development services. And what this meant was that people seeking hormone blocking treatment under the age of 16 were suddenly subject to a court application for a best interest order. Now, this was in stark contrast to the previous concept of Gillip competence that many of us are aware of um, in the medical profession. 
Now, this caused a lot of worry and distrust within the transgender community. And thankfully, in January, permission was granted to appeal the High Court judgment. And in March of this year, the High Court ruled that parents will be able to give consent for their children to take puberty delaying drugs during gender identity treatment without having to gain a judge's approval. Now, whilst this is very positive, um, it does still depend on parents giving consent for this, which is still a difficult issue in some circumstances. So moving on to the 1980s, clearly this decade needs no introduction. In 1981, Terence Higgins was the first British man to be diagnosed with and die of AIDS at St. Thomas's Hospital in London. Initially, AIDS was seen as a gay disease and homosexual men were demonized and shamed by the public and medical professionals. Terence Higgins' partner and close friends later set up the Terence Higgins Trust that is still a leading sexual health and HIV charity in the UK. And by the end of 80, 1984, there had been 108 AIDS cases and 46 deaths in the UK. It wasn't until 85 that the Department of Health published its first guidance for medical practitioners and the HIV test was developed. And in 87, the government AIDS awareness campaign um, of television adverts and leaflets bearing the slogan, don't die of ignorance was delivered to every household in order to raise awareness of HIV and AIDS. In 1987, Princess Diana opened England's first specialist AIDS hospital ward, the Broderick Ward in the now de demolished Middlesex Hospital. And this is where the media took pictures of her shaking hands with an AIDS patient with no gloves and helping to change attitudes around this illness. And then in 1996, highly active antiretroviral therapy, which combined um, a number of antiretroviral therapies became the gold standard for HIV therapy. And most recently in 2010, um, a kind of landmark study on pre-exposure prophylaxis showed that tr the medication Truvada protected against acquiring HIV in the MSM population. This was named PrEP. And in 2012, the UK PROUD study started with 500 people that showed that there was a relative risk reduction of 86% of acquiring HIV in people taking PrEP. So immediately there were calls for this to be available to as many patients as possible. And as with any new treatment that is quite expensive, NHS England initially said it wouldn't fund PrEP as disease prevention fell within local authorities' remit. But legal, legal actions later ensued and ruled that NHS England could fund PrEP and Travada was later denied a patent extension in 2018, which allowed it to be a lot more affordable for the NHS. In 2016, NHS England announced an extension of the Proud study to over 10,000 people and then to 26,000 in 2019. And um, in October of last year, uncapped PrEP was made to be available in the UK with funds allocated to the local authorities. And that's a really, really landmark step forward. And there's been some amazing work on this um, throughout the country. So having done a kind of whirlwind tour of LGBT plus history, um, we can move on to some of the health inequalities that have been identified in LGBT plus communities um, within the UK. And a number of reports and surveys have been completed in the last three years on this, um, including the world's largest LGBT plus health survey, which we'll look at now. So the National LGBT Survey was a government run survey nationwide of LGBT plus and intersex people. And over 100,000 people completed this survey between July and October 2017. This, as I mentioned, makes it the largest survey of LGBT people in the world and showed some rather concerning results. This also led to the creation of the government's LGBT action plan that we will touch on later. And to add a bit of a positive aspect to this, sexual health in the UK was shown to be a relative success story. 
And about 70% of people said that it had been very easy or easy to access sexual health services within the UK. And almost nine in 10 of them um, said that it had been a positive experience. Now, to look at some of the more concerning results, um, just over a third of trans people said that they had had a negative experience in healthcare due to their gender identity. 18% had experienced inappropriate curiosity and 18% of LGBT people had avoided treatment for fear of discrimination or intolerant reactions. And 80% said that access to gender identity services had not been easy. And in fact, 16% of trans respondents had gone outside of the UK to pay for healthcare or medical treatment. Um, and a further 50% said they were considering it. So Stonewall also completed a health report in 2018 where it clearly showed some worrying results also. Over half of LGBT people said they'd experienced depression in the preceding year, and this increased to 62% in the BAME LGBT population. And one in eight had sadly um, said that they'd attempted to take their own life in the last year when the population between 18 and 24 years old was asked. And this is in comparison with less than 1% of the general population when compared with the um, general population data. The LGBT Foundation also completed a health inequality report in 2020 where they found similar results. 19% of BAME LGBT people had experienced some form of unequal treatment from healthcare staff because of their LGBT identity. And this was compared to 13% of LGBT people overall and 8% of disabled LGBT people had made an attempt to take their own life in the year preceding the survey. So why are these differences present and how can we kind of try and counteract some of these? In terms of physical health, um, one in six LGBT people drink alcohol every day. This is in comparison to one in 10 of the general population. Drug use is higher in LGBT populations with over a quarter of LGB adults um, reporting drug use in the last year versus 8% of heterosexual adults. There are higher rates of smoking, higher rates of homelessness with a quarter of homeless people aged 16 to 24 in the UK being LGBT and other conditions including HIV. In terms of access to healthcare, We've already mentioned fear of disclosure, lack of understanding from healthcare professionals being often quoted, and long wait times and travel distances, particularly for gender identity services. In terms of mental health, there are experiences of discrimination and harassment, and also the ever constant fear of rejection from family or friends and the rate of hate crimes in the UK. In terms of looking at the BAME population in particular, over half of BAME LGBT people face discrimination from within the LGBT community. And this population is also more likely to have experienced negative inappropriate incidents inside of the home, such as um, coercive behavior, um, domestic abuse within the last 12 months. Now, as I mentioned before, it's difficult to talk about health inequality or to talk about health in general without just touching on COVID and its profound effect to all communities within the UK. The message was very clear to stay at home, um, but what if it's not safe to stay at home? Stonewall started its campaign, Stay In for LGBT, in order to help to support people to self-isolate, quarantine, and um, feel supported during this isolated time. But they also raised awareness of the fact that a quarter of young people are at risk of homelessness within the LGBT community. One in 10 LGBT people have faced domestic abuse and many have had to go back into the closet and move in with homophobic families during a time that is already so difficult for many. In addition, there are a number of LGBT asylum seekers and refugees who have already fled their homes and are living in cramped conditions with many different people and strangers, um, many of which they can't be open about their sexuality with. 
So the risk of COVID is much higher in these populations. We already know that COVID does discriminate and there's been a lot of evidence to show that the BAME population is disproportionately impacted with higher rates of diagnosis in black ethnic groups, higher death rates in black and Asian ethnic groups. And the LGBT Foundation therefore did an online survey of over 500 people to see if these figures were shared with the LGBT population. And sadly, it showed that they were. About 8% of people in that survey said they didn't feel safe where they were currently staying. And that's, that increased to 17% in trans people and in non-binary people. 40% would like to access support for their mental health during this time. And that increased to almost two thirds in BAME LGBT people. Over a third of LGBT people had had a medical appointment canceled. Now, clearly this happened for many people throughout the country. But again, particular, particularly looking at things like gender identity services, this can be particularly traumatic. And 18% of people were concerned that the situation was going to lead to a substance abuse or alcohol misuse relapse. So now to move on to primary care. Now, primary care is often the first point of contact for healthcare for most people. NHS Digital says that about 90% of patient interaction takes place in primary care services. And this, what we're talking about here is GP, dentistry, community pharmacy, and optometry. Now, primary care is based on caring for people rather than specific diseases. And it's clear from everything we've covered so far that LGBT plus people have a number of specific health needs. Um, and so it would be good to look at how these are being addressed within primary care and in particularly within general practice as this is the focus of our talk today. So the LGBT Foundation did a primary care survey in 2017 as part of Pride in Practice, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, and this looked at LGBT plus experience of accessing primary care services, and they got 300 survey responses. Now, another survey is currently underway, so we'll have more up-to-date data soon. But what this survey showed was that approximately a third of LGBT people felt that their GP didn't meet their needs as an LGBT person. And over two thirds of GP practices could improve LGBT services. So let's first look at disclosure of LGBT plus status. This graph shows the percentage of patients accessing primary care within the different um, communities of the LGBT plus spectrum. Now, as you can see on the graph on the right, the majority of patients have accessed primary care and therefore the results from the survey should give us insight into their experiences. So to look now at the percentage of LGBT people who disclose their sexual orientation or gender identity to their GP, we can see that this is considerably lower than the previous graph. Now, why is this? Many respondents identified having to justify their sexual orientation or gender to health professionals as a barrier that discouraged them from accessing primary care altogether. And all LGBT people felt that improving visibility would encourage them to access services and disclose their identities. Now, on a more positive note, over half of people who had disclosed their orientation um, said that they had a positive or very positive response from their GP. But the problem is that many don't. Trans people were five times more likely than cis people to consider anonymity when registering with a GP. And those that did disclose their trans status to their GP were 62% more likely to feel their GP met their health needs. And therefore, it's really bringing to light how important disclosing um, one's LGBT status or gender identity can be to improving um, our healthcare experience. Many noted that healthcare professionals lacked confidence in how, when, or why to ask about sexual orientation, and very few patients reported being referred to LGBT specific services. So for example, those trans and LGBT patients that discussed counseling with their GP 
disclosed that less than 5% of these patients had been referred to LGBT specific services. And some trans respondents reported that their GP had refused to refer them to gender identity clinics because they didn't understand the need for a referral. Another reason why patients may be kind of reluctant to disclose their status is fear of discrimination. Now, as this graph shows on the left, um, as you move from lesbian and bisexual women to men, bisexual people in general, trans and non-binary people, the experiences of discrimination and unfair treatment that people have had at their GP, which is in the light blue color, um, increases significantly. And in addition to that, it's really important that we consider the needs of patients with multiple protected characteristics. So 32% of BAME LGBT people experience discrimination or unfair treatment based on their sexual orientation or gender identity at their GP, in contrast with only 16% of white LGBT people. The report made a number of recommendations and put them under the headings inclusion, expansion and voice. So firstly, LGBT training for specific health issues, ensuring that healthcare professionals are educated about the issues that affect our community. Sexual orientation and trans status monitoring. So monitoring is crucial for improving health outcomes of LGBT communities. And it means that primary care services are able to ensure equitable access to treatment and identify differences to treatment outcomes. In terms of expansion, we need to be celebrating high standards. This can be with awards such as the Pride and Practice Awards um, or engagement with LGBT History Month, Health Week, HIV Testing Week and Pride. And voice, increasing visibility. LGBT people need to see themselves represented within GP um, practices and therefore they'll be more likely to disclose their LGBT status and it's really important that when people do disclose their status to respond positively to that. So in line with this, um, the LGBT Foundation started Pride in Practice. This is a quality assurance and social prescribing program for primary care services. And it was started in 2011 as a kind of pilot program in Manchester and this was to start putting out awareness posters in GP practices to improve visibility and increase access for LGBT plus communities. With the popularity of this in 2013, it developed into a quality assurance services with a toolkit that had a suite of resources that would be shared with GP practices in order to improve knowledge of LGBT health and also improve visibility. In 2016, um, Pride in Practice became fully trans inclusive and this made it the UK's only LGBT social prescribing model and a charter mark for primary care. And some of the work that has happened has been really quite incredible, just shown here in some of the results from that paper. Every single health professional that was involved in this evidenced changes to their practice to better support the needs of LGBT people. Almost everyone reported feeling more informed and more confident when working with LGBT communities. And a large percentage of services had implemented sexual orientation monitoring and trans status monitoring in order to help improve health services going forward. Now looking ahead to LGBT health within the NHS, so in 2018, the government started the LGBT Action Plan, and this looked at policies to improve healthcare for LGBT people specifically, and involved 75 commitments to do this. January of 2019, the NHS Long-Term Plan was published. Now this was the strategy for healthcare in England for the following decade, and part of the plan focused on the need to reduce health inequalities, but LGBT people were not one of the specific groups targeted. The LGBT Action Plan made a number of health commitments, such as appointing a national advisor, improving the way gender identity services worked, and all of these 10 health commitments. Now, the House of Commons Women's and Equalities Committee 
had a session in 2019, where they commented on the fact that a number of these had been actioned, which was very positive, but it's very difficult to quantify if any measurable impact had been made, in particular because mechanisms to measure the impact of these policies were not in place. In addition to this, the LGBT action plan is not embedded into NHS strategy, and so its implementation is not the responsibility of the Department of Health and Social Care. So in summary, we've had a look at the origins of the NHS, we've spoken about LGBT health within the last 70 years, and then looked at some of the evidence and data around health inequalities within our community, touched upon COVID, and then gone into some of the issues that particularly affect primary care, and some of the ways that we can improve LGBT health within primary care. And finally, looked at plans for the future with a hopefully positive light. So following on from my presentation, we're gonna now move on to a panel discussion to look into more detail and discuss some of the issues around primary care that I mentioned. Um, and I'd like to thank you all again for listening. So uh, hello everyone, uh, welcome. Uh, well, first of all, happy Pride Month and um, welcome to the panel discussion part of this video. Uh, thank you for thank you first of all to Abtin for delivering that very very in depth and informative presentation, which uh, we're now going to explore in a bit more depth and detail. Um, before we get started on that, just some first introductions. Um, my name's Adrian Harrop. I'm a GP based up in Liverpool. Um, as well as being a, a regular, ordinary working GP, I have a bit of a specialist interest in the provision of gender affirmative care to transgender and non-binary people. I'm working within and amongst the wider LGBTQ community up here in Liverpool. Um, in terms of who else we've got here today with us, we've got, of course, Dr. Abtin Sadegi. Um, Abtin, if you could introduce yourself for everyone, please. Yeah, sure. I'm um, Abtin. I'm an anaesthetic registrar working in Northwest London. Um, I think my interest in this area really began when I started um, working with the LGBT charity Schools Out UK. And um, I started looking into health inequalities and how we can kind of affect those and improve those through education and that's where my kind of passion for this began really. So that's fantastic thank you very much for joining us Abtin and we've also got um, Dr Martha Jones as well. Martha hello. Hi there uh, my name's Martha um, I am a GP ST1 based in East London so I'm very early on in my primary care career um, and I have an interest in LGBTQ plus healthcare and how we as GPs can improve um, access to LGBTQ plus healthcare, particularly for trans and non-binary patients and how we can make that healthcare more accessible, um, more welcoming um, and provide that kind of life-saving gender affirmative healthcare as well. That's fantastic, Martha, and thank you so much for joining us. And we've also, um, one of our colleagues from Northern Ireland is here with us today. We've got Nancy Conroy. Hello, Nancy. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Nancy Conroy. I'm a GP and GP trainer here in County Antrim in Northern Ireland. Um, I'm also a member of the Institute of Psychosexual Medicine. Um, we were recently able to bring um, some two very successful virtual meetings to our membership um, on LGBT matters. Um, in 2016, I was invited onto a working group which by the RCGP and I, um, and was involved in the writing and editing of two sister documents, uh, guidelines for the care of LGB patients in primary care and guidelines for the care of trans patients um, in primary care. Um, currently, I'm sitting on a review panel in Northern Ireland, uh, which is uh, re-examining and redesigning our ge adult gender service really from the bottom up. Um, so I was delighted to be asked to be involved today. Thank you. That's great, Nancy. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, finally, we have uh, Dr. Rafiq Taibji. Apologies if I pronounced your name incorrectly there, Rafiq. You're going to have to correct me. I'm sorry about that. That was perfect. So, hi. Uh, yeah, I'm Rafiq. Uh, I'm a, a GP partner in South London and a training program to, uh, director for general practice at King's. 
Um, and I've really been interested in this as a, as a gay man myself. Um, I chaired uh, GLAD, the Gay and Lesbian Dots Let's Association, and used to be actually an LGBT history tour guide in Soho. So I was really passionate about what Abtin presented in, in his, in his uh, presentation. Um, I have had the honour of being uh, part of the NHS England uh, gender pathway as part of their clinical reference group. Um, and presently, my, my interest is that I am the co-chair of the um, LGBT special interest group for Wonka, that's the World GP Association. So uh, it's a real honour, though, to be here today. Fantastic, Rafiq. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so there are so many different areas that we could touch on based on what Abtin raised in his, uh, in his discussion earlier on. Um, there's a few different areas that we decided that we were going to touch on in a little bit more depth and explore in a bit more detail. Um, we were probably going to have a look at some of those more um, legacy issues, those more historical themes that were brought up by Abtin, particularly around the issue of conversion therapy. And so I'd be very interested to talk a little bit more about that. We were going to explore some of the gender affirmative care related issues in some more depth and I know that the whole panel here has their own insights and perspectives on that they'll be very interesting to share with one another um, and then we were going to talk a little bit more about what the vision is moving forward what the action plan is for the next stage as it were um, so Nancy could I ask you just to touch on a little bit about what um, Abtin raised in his conversation about and his discussion sorry about um some of those legacy issues, some of those historical themes. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. I think that struck a real chord um, with me having, um, you know, uh, gr gr growing up in Northern Ireland and then having university and part of my medical career in Scotland, which culturally some, in some ways isn't that different to where I'm living now. And then moving back into um, Northern Ireland for my general practice career. Um, you know, I have, um, you know, school friends I'm 41, but I have school friends who left Northern Ireland for university and never came back because Northern Ireland, even in my lifetime, has been not an accepting place to live as um, an LGBT person. Um, I suppose I'm speaking from personal experience of friends who are more, more um, LGB. Um, and, you, you know, politically, Northern Ireland has been even further behind than the rest of the other nations. You know, England had same-sex marriage in um, six years behind, uh, we're six years behind England. We only just um, got same-sex marriage on the 13th of January, 2020, which is a staggering, you know, staggering date. Um, and yet we're trying to say to our patients that we're, um, accepting of your rights and we're accepting of your of your way of life and 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 who you are but yet um i feel very strongly that in northern ireland where that sort of judeo-christian um culture um is magnified here um but it's it's all over the uk for sure and there's obviously in other parts of the uk other religious factors coming in um but i think that that's not to be underestimated the ongoing pressure um, and shame and guilt and it's a sin aspect um, that um, LGB and plus and slash T uh, people are having to live with on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. um, and I suppose historically the village GP would have probably attended the same church wouldn't they um, so you know that the GP gets mixed up in the in the culture's um, judgmental attitudes to uh, to these uh, patients so it's just something that really struck home when Abton was talking about it, you know, Alan Turing, you know, that sort of, you know, such a long time ago, yet in many ways we're kind of stuck with some of these attitudes, which in parts of Northern Ireland seem magnified compared to the other nations, but I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on that. Yeah, it's interesting how we talk about these things as being historical, yet this isn't all that long ago, this is very much within adult living memory isn't it you know we're only talking about something like 50 years ago and there are plenty of people walking around now who are our patients now who will have experienced these exact type of treatments themselves and um, is this something that you still see amongst your population in Northern Ireland people who still experience these sort of 
conversion therapy types type techniques and it's definitely there in the background if you speak to you know charities like rainbow foundation in, in northern ireland it's there um but it's it's very underground and it's not something that patients who've experienced it would readily share maybe with their gp they'd be more likely to share it with other voluntary sector organizations like rainbow um, but it's there and it's and it's in the background and it was very recently in the uh, political forum um, and was one of the reasons cited for Arlene Foster getting uh, kicked out of uh, being the leader of the DUP was that she uh, anyway I won't I won't go into the politics of it but it's 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 around yeah staggering really isn't it um Rafiq is this something that you encounter in your everyday life as a GP in London um similar sort of similar sort of stuff going on there yeah I, th I think one of the things one has to remember when one's a GP is sometimes we're seen as part of the establishment and so we represent some of that history that Nancy's just talked about um, and I like to think that most of the colleagues in fact all the colleagues I work for um, with uh, are very pro-gay. In fact, I probably got my partnership because I was a gay man. Uh, and they thought I'd have great parties and, you know, it, it, I'm being slightly silly, but actually I think most of my colleagues are fantastic, um, warm individuals. However, that doesn't necessarily translate to how people perceive us. And I think we have to make that extra effort to show that we are not one of the, the people holding prejudice against LGBT people. And, I, you know, I inspect practices as for CQC and I go into practices where I still see a cross on the wall of the consulting room with pictures of family and I, I can understand why they would want to have those those clinicians but it does send a message that makes people extra cautious when coming out to them and I, I appreciate you know people should be free to express themselves how they want but if it comes at a consequence because of that baggage that some people definitely carry from mistreatment historically I think we should think about that. Um, and then I, it has led me on to a question, though, really, about how much doctors should be agents of social change, because, you know, uh, Nancy mentioned all those sort of civil rights that are and in, in, inequalities. Um, and, you know, I was really, I, I, you know, Martha's on, on, on this call. And, and, and you know, I, I think that, you know, uh, often I, I have to say I use the, the, the younger generation of doctors coming through to be often the people who educate people. I certainly know. Um, you know, as a trainer, um, some people have come to my practice and had to use, explain what non-binary meant to the other colleagues. And I, I think that's fantastic, to be honest. I don't think that's negative. But I, I wonder what, whether this resonates with Martha. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that I, I think that moving forward in my career, I want to be an agent for social change. I think that's a big kind of aspiration that I have for myself, um, for, for all patients, but in particular for the LGBTQ plus community. I think as a gay woman myself, I want to make sure I'm advocating for my community and really pushing for, the, for everybody's right to, to kind of live in this society freely and openly. And uh, that's what I would like to aim to do in my career. I know it's a very early on start, but, I think we absolutely should be agents of social change as doctors. We should be fighting for our patients' rights, pushing forward and making sure they can access all the kinds of treatments that they want and kind of, yeah, act, act in their best interests as well. Are these the kind of issues that are coming up for you as a trainee, Martha, as part of your day-to-day -day experience of engaging with the training curriculum? Are these themes that are coming up for you? Um, I'd say that, in my VTS program, um, we've not necessarily had teaching from our colleagues or from our trainers so far kind of on these topics. I've had to access those topics myself kind of via the RCGP website, which the resources have been great via that website. But I think this is kind of through a lot of my own work that I've been trying to access those topics. Um, I think it's something that would be, could, we could be taught about more um, on our curriculum and could there could be kind of a closer focus in on as well. Um, through my BTS training, but also kind of thinking back to medical school, I graduated about six years ago, and I'm sure there's been a lot more change since I finished medical school, but we did not get any training or any teaching or anything like that at all. It just wasn't visible at all. So I think 
I feel like I'm obviously a little delayed kind of <laughs> getting into making sure I'm pushing forward for kind of LGBTQ plus healthcare. Um, but yeah, it, at the moment, I think within our VTS in particular, I think we could be doing a bit better. Mm-hmm. I know, Abtin, you're um, probably at a more senior stage in your training now, aren't you? Did you say you're an ST4 or 5, did you say? I'm um, just finishing ST5. ST5, definitely mirror a lot of what Martha was saying Um, and I think that um, you know doctors and nurses keep coming up as the most trusted professions um, whenever there's a survey and so we really do have a duty to kind of educate ourselves about these issues now some of us will have more of a kind of personal connection so do this automatically but I think it's really important that it's shadowed in the medical curriculum and that's an area that I'm particularly kind of passionate about. Um, I teach at Imperial College um, and they've done a lot of really great work to kind of introduce um, concepts of actualizing, um, which is kind of, um, you know, usualizing LGBT people within the curriculum. So not even having specific teaching topics about definitions and things but actually just having the communication skill stations or the case studies include lgbt plus characters and people in their role plays just starts to make people more comfortable with dealing with people that are from different communities and then hopefully when they come into um, practice with you know real patients they've already encountered people from the lgbt plus community and the issues that they may face so I think that's a really useful way of getting this topic started. Mm. Sorry, Rafiq, did you have something you wanted to, to share? Yeah, I, I think this is, yeah, you're absolutely right about that usualization. I, I guess it's a bit of a dilemma as an educator, actually, though, because, you know, I think that's great for things like communication uh, and just, you know, not stammering when you come across something that makes you uncomfortable you've never encountered before. Um, but that's really, you know, basic level. I think that's great for medical school. But unfortunately, what I see, um, certainly in postgraduate medical education, is that seen as the tick. OK, we've done LGBT stuff. Um, and actually, there's so much more, isn't there, about health inequalities. And if you don't know about those health inequalities and the knowledge, you actually do need to have knowledge. And as GP should have a certain amount of knowledge about LGBT issues that goes beyond that communication. The problem is if you make it invisible, that makes it harder then to put that actually in a specific slot. And then the exam also, you know, I mean, what certainly the colleges, you know, to be blunt, you know, I think they would say, oh, we always make sure we have a a gay character in our exams and things like that. And I said, that's great, but where is the specific healthcare needs of being someone who's LGBT going to be addressed in an exam? Mm. Um, um, so you know I totally you, I, I don't want to criticize what you're saying because I think it's really important that it is in their spiral curriculum and integrated in the curriculum but it sure. does need specific touch point mentions yeah absolutely I mean like just to kind of buttress what Rafiq was just saying there um, about the difference between those quite generic level communication skills that people acquire at medical school or nursing school or in any kind of training to become a healthcare professional um, versus the difference for us as working GPs as the so-called expert generalist knowing uh, knowing about in-depth knowledge um, of those health inequalities that exist for members of the LGBT community and knowing that more inside out I think is a, a very very valuable thing that perhaps doesn't get quite as recognized as it ought to. No definitely it does, it, I agree. Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just, you know, I think that from where I'm coming from, it's it's starting at one point and making sure those basic levels are actually introduced. And then, of course, you know, there's so much, as you know, my presentation showed, that is really important to be aware of. But just to kind of begin at that level and then, like you said, spiral learning, fill in those gaps and be like, why are we actually pushing this? Why is this important? Because of these statistics. And 100% like that is an area that needs to be improved, I agree. Yeah. I think we're all agreeing, but it's almost just, it's, I like to repeat, you're talking about a spiral. 
Um, in Northern Ireland, we've had a huge influx of international graduates joining our GP vocational training scheme, which is fantastic. And one thing Northern Ireland needs is a bit of diversity, fantastic. But we've recognised pretty early on that they need those basics about how to speak to an LGBT person without causing offence pretty quickly. And me as a GP trainer, I, I mean, I do that tutorial with all our GP trainees, but that's just one trainee out of how many in the VTS. Um, and perhaps we can't spiral up to that more in-depth stuff that Rafiq is talking about, unless people are comfortable with the basics that Abton referred to. Um, and I was really struck by your statistics, Abton, especially about trans patients being uh, offended by curiosity, for example. And I just thought, goodness me, someone's just made a mess of that consultation. You know, you know I, I bet you the majority of those people who caused that offence didn't mean to. And that's, it's sort of arming GPs with a script that they can fall back on, that they can be comfortable with, that they're gonna know, well, look, if I ask this question in this way, I'm unlikely to cause offence. And if I cause offence, I know that I can apologise. So arming them with that basics is probably going to be needed in a lot of cases, but in an ideal world, yeah, absolutely. It would be great if everybody had more knowledge. Yeah, fantastic. So, I mean, just going on from there, I mean, one other thing that Abtin did touch on during his, um, during his discussion um, was some of the historical aspects of how um, gender affirmative or trans healthcare has been developed in the UK historically, you know, because we're talking about clinics that were founded now, you know, 40 years ago plus. Um, I was hoping that we could talk a little bit more about what things look like right now for trans patients trying to navigate their way through NHS healthcare services, because obviously there are a lot of challenges um, in this area from a multitude of different angles. Um, Rafiq, I know that you were keen to talk to us a little bit about the um, issues relating to waiting times and such like. Is that something you could tell us a bit more about? Yeah, I, th I think just before we talk about that, I just wanted to mention that you have to remember that, you know, someone's identity um, and their gender, um, they will have their own perspective of that. And yet the NHS through necessity, through commissioning, creates a very clear pathway and real human beings don't fit into pathways. They're, they're individuals and they want to have the treatments that they think are right for them. And interestingly, you know, if you were a surgeon offering varicose vein surgery, the patient would be offered options and they might choose the one that they think is the best for them. Um, and, and it is the same with, with, with gender care. Now, the issue really is that we, in the, I, I know much more about England, of course, but you know, in England, there are eight gender clinics. Um, and um, so people have to travel a very disproportionate distance to access the care. And the waiting times in those clinics are totally unacceptable. Now, I was on the clinical reference group discussing this about six years, seven years ago when we were saying there are not enough clinicians with expertise in the country and that people need training in this, this is a specialism, and so that we can expand those services because for as long as we know, there have been waits of over two years to see a gender specialist. Yet, and that's against the NHS constitution in England. It should be 18 weeks from the point of referral. And we accept that. How is it we accept that? It's direct discrimination if the NHS uh, management do not do something to show positive steps are being made to shorten the waiting time. But rather than that, what we've actually seen is an extension in the waiting time. It's getting worse and worse and worse. Um, and, and I just don't understand how that's acceptable. And then we then get into these arguments as GPs, because what happens is GPs don't want to have to take responsibility for things that have risk, that they don't have as much training in. So then what do they do? They say, no, I'm not doing it. You'll have to wait. And then the patient suffers. Uh, and I think that's really fundamental to the, the whole issue. And what we're seeing, and I'm sure Adrian and others will, will say this, is, is that, that what we're actually seeing is, is patients having to go private who can't even afford to do so. 
they then have to find the, the cheapest service they can that will just get them maybe even hormones, which is the you know, starting building block. And then the GPs asked to continue prescribing and bridging, which, you know, I think morally we probably have to think about our obligations to do that. But I absolutely sympathise with then GPs saying, I don't really know enough. I don't feel comfortable. Um, I, I, I can certainly point them in the right direction of how they can find out more. Absolutely. But fundamentally, this has all happened because of an under-resourced NHS system for gender services. Does, um, does your experience in Northern Ireland, Nancy, does that parallel with that? Does that correspond with what Rafiq's telling us about the waiting times in England? Yeah, it, it, it does. I'll just touch on Scotland because there isn't a Scot here to represent Scotland. I know Scotland's adult gender services are divided east and west between Edinburgh, which is a sort of um, <clears throat> nurse specialist nurse-led service, and the Sandyford in Glasgow, which has a sort of multidisciplinary team. Um, so, and, but I think that they are struggling with wait times for sure. But I think that compared to the service um, in Northern Ireland, it, it's sort of, you know, dazzlingly good. Um, the service in Northern Ireland has been uh, traditionally under the realm of psychiatry and has been becoming increasingly not fit for purpose um, over the last few years for a number of reasons um, and kind of really got to breaking point where the service held their hands up and said look we we are really not a functioning service anymore we are not we are not an effective service this needs completely rubbed out and, and drawn again so that's what's happening in northern ireland but of course the, the, the patients have to wait for us to do that um, every step of the of the way in um, we're, we're trying to do things as fast as we can people come up with oh that type of you know shared prescribing guideline that would be 18 months no 18 months is too long we have to do it in a quicker way so there's a there's a huge amount of will in northern ireland to to, to get a service that is fit for purpose but in the meantime we've got patients that are really um stuck so i've got patients who perhaps are suicidal because of their gender dysphoria. So I refer them to the community mental health team who identify them as having a gender problem and then discharge them back to me saying, this is a gender problem. You need to refer them to the gender service, which I've done, but I've had to tell my patient of oh, they're maybe taking one patient off the waiting list a month. You know, it's a non-functioning service at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna go in depth into the challenges of bridging because at the minute, we don't have a functioning service to bridge to. Mm. So at the minute in Northern Ireland, I would say overall, there's not very much bridging going on, um, but it's really um, a huge hot topic. But I think there's a huge amount of goodwill and positive forward action um, in Northern Ireland. And we can only hope that uh, that will come to fruition for a, a decent service for our patients. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of this definitely aligns with my own personal experience here in Liverpool. Um, there are a, you know, a number of different projects that are being led by NHS England at the moment with regard to setting up more primary care led services. Uh, but they are, you know, they're limited, they're small scale, they're non-specialist, um, and they aren't really enough to, to bridge the gap that exists between um, patient demand and service demand and service provision um, in that the services that are in place in England certainly at the present time are just totally inadequate for the um, for the level of patient demand that's being placed on them like just to take you know one in the clinic which I won't name you know that was maybe in the past month when you look at their month by month figures has seen dealt with and discharged maybe six patients and has had another 36 patients added to the waiting list. And so month by month, that waiting list is growing exponentially. And the patients who are being seen now for a first assessment, and it will be the first of half a dozen different appointments that they may have going through that service over a period of years, those patients have already been waiting 34, 35, 36 months 
to get to that first appointment. And, you know, to put these vulnerable patients who are struggling with that burden, that mental health difficulties, that the difficulties that they're having as a result of experiencing gender dysphoria, it's totally unacceptable, as Rafiq said. Um, I mean, Martha, I don't know whether in your experience of a trainee right now, is this a theme? Is this something that's coming up in your education and your training about how to deal with and manage these patients better? Uh, to be honest, not really. Um, from my experience so far within this last year, it's, it's not something that's coming up. It's not something that's particularly uh, spoken about. I know that that was something I, that I was interested to explore on this panel was, was how was we how we as kind of primary care physicians can can do better and, and I know that you've briefly touched on kind of the NHS led uh, pilots of the primary care leading the pilots up in Liverpool and that was something that kind of was on my mind can we as GPs um, take more of a role in kind of in gender affirming healthcare but like you said it's not specialist you know are we going to be doing the right thing are we going to have enough knowledge you know to be able to give patients what they need um but yeah we it's not something really that that's coming up um it's it's just through kind of my own reading that i'm you know reading about what we do for bridging prescriptions how we how we manage that in primary care um and just kind of what the waiting times are and things that's kind of just through through reading of my own fruition essentially that that, that I, i'm learning about this but it, it's not something that's touched upon for us at, at the moment and you know at one point whilst this is actually really promising to hear that we have trainees relatively very junior within the training scheme who are taking that initiative to train themselves in what to do mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, you do have practitioners like myself as one example, yeah. who offers um, bridging prescriptions to a number of my, my patients who need them. And I feel reasonably competent and confident at doing that with the amount of support I have around me and the amount of self-directed training I've done in that field. Um, but in reality, as Nancy said, this isn't a bridging prescription because I'm not really bridging them to anything. I'm giving them a prescription for hormones and taking the responsibility for that prescription on my own shoulders. Um, and I'm prescribing those hormones for the foreseeable future, which could be for many, many years to come before that patient meets a specialist gender practitioner, before they can access those more in-depth, um, mental health, medical, surgical interventions that they may require. This is not really a bridging prescription that's only lasting for 12 weeks or 12 months or anything like that kind of time span. This is reaching well into the future. And that's a that's a different sort of thing to signing up to a short term bridging prescription, you know? You know? And, and Adrian, I, I wonder how you feel about that, because so there's a lot of history, isn't there, also in people who've been seen as maverick, I think would be the yeah. way out, and, you know, who've gone before the GMC yeah. by being criticised by perhaps, one could argue, slightly transphobic people mm. um, who don't like the idea of transgender services full stop uh, and being, you know, hauled up in front of committees because they chose to give a prescription. Um, uh, and thank goodness there's a growing evidence base for those prescriptions. Mm. But it must, do you feel anxious? Because I, I, I certainly, I, I, I share with you, I share some interest in this. I've gone, you know, I've sat in G GIC connects and things like that, you know, but even I'm very anxious about signing on the dotted line for a prescription. Yeah, and I mean, it comes with a certain degree of anxiety. And I think one has to be very, very careful about the patient population that one selects. Um, you know, like I set some pretty clear boundaries with my own patients is I don't prescribe for people who are under the age of 18. I just don't. Um, it's not so much that I don't think those people need treatment. Of course, they do need treatment if they present in a certain way. Um, but that's an area that I know is not within my expertise. That isn't something I'm comfortable and confident doing. Um, so I do set that boundary for myself. You know, obviously, if there are patients who have really complicated mental health histories that's another another factor that might prevent me from prescribing for them you know if there is a history there of psychosis or other very complex major mental health problems um 
But, you know, for the most part, most trans patients who present for um, gender affirmative healthcare are not in that sort of position. You know, the vast majority of them are autonomous, independent, mentally sound adults who can give informed consent for these treatments. And so in those situations, I'm quite happy. And luckily, you know, I work in a context and environment that is very supportive of that in that, you know, I have a lot of support from my colleagues in my own practice. I have a lot of specialist support from an endocrinology point of view um, from neighboring hospitals and trusts that offer our, our practice a lot of support. So that, that's all very reassuring and makes me feel much more secure. Although I do know that I'm in quite a uniquely privileged position doing that working in the sort of environment I do and I can completely sympathize with a whole number of my general practice colleagues who don't have that same level of experience or um, that same level of support within their everyday work environment where they may well say you know I'm just not comfortable I just do not feel confident that I can defend this decision in the long term and I, I get it I get the apprehension that they feel for sure definitely definitely there's definitely something here about Martha who's a young enthusiastic GP trainee who is interested in this not having anyone to look up to as a GP who's developed this as a specialist interest and is working in a specialist clinic you know, for her to even speak to about which diploma do I do to get your job, you know, so that is key in, in, in medicine, I'm sure Abton will say the same in anaesthetics, is that you have to see um, someone above you doing it before you kind of go there yourself, so to me, Martha's in this perfect position to maybe do like quite a lot of extra training and potentially she could have a one day a week working in a gender clinic, I'm not saying you have to Martha, but you could but the fact that it's not even being raised with you as an ST1 is worrying because we find when we started doing this work in Northern Ireland about how a new service would look, there was a little bit of an assumption that established GPs would want to step out and make this an area of specialist interest. And we kind of said, look, hang on a moment. I'm 41. GPs of my age have already developed our area of specialist interest. You know, you're, you're speaking to the wrong people. You need to go and speak to Martha. It's something to think about. Mm. I mean, it is certainly something that we've touched upon um, in discussions at various different levels about the idea of creating fellowships uh, for people who are interested, people of Martha's generation, not to be patronising to you, Martha, no, of course. <laughs> no, no, but people who are at that very, very early stage of training where, they, where the world is their oyster when it comes to exploring these different opportunities for further specialist training. And I mean, I think the appetite is there for it, but for some reason, there seems to be a, a definite reticence and a fear almost of being brave enough to develop these services. And I do wish we could kind of channel in a little bit to the energy that, that Abton alluded to in his presentation about those pioneering clinicians who set up these gender identity clinics many, many decades ago. Um, and you think that, of course, when they first started their journeys, you know, when they started their clinics up, I'm sure there were plenty of critics around at the time when they did it. Um, and I'm sure if those people were still around now, um, I don't know if many of them are, but if any of them are still around, I'm sure they're quite disappointed to see that this is this is only the point we've got to, despite many, many decades of having the opportunity to evolve and develop these services. And despite the demand being there, for some reason, things have just not evolved. Things have come across barrier after barrier that's got in their way. Do you, do you know, Abtin, how that's come about? You know, because looking back on the, his, the, his, the history that you told us in your presentation, is there a reason why things have kind of hit these roadblocks, do you think? I think, I mean, I can't answer for sure, but I think that it seems like it's taken a while for gender identity services to come into, you know, some form of action plan, finally, in the LGBT action plan. And it says clearly as one of their main health commitments that they need to improve the way gender identity services work. Now, that's a very generalized statement. Um, it's not really backed up by any implementation plan. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, it's not embedded into NHS strategy. So it's 
kind of feels as though it's only now that people have even started realizing we need to do something about this. And um, the LGBT survey that happened um, in the UK was kind of the first time that we had proper evidence to back up what we were saying that these services are inadequate, patients are not getting an appropriate service. Um, and I feel like the motivation and the momentum is there now. And it's just a shame that it hasn't, you know, been at that level over the past kind of years since gender identity services started in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, you know, a real shame that it's taken this long, but it still seems like there isn't any um, very kind of legislative action taking place to make sure that these things happen and are put in place. I don't know if you agree with me in that. Yeah, so Rafiq, were you going to say something there on, the, on that particular point? Yeah, I, 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 do, I do want, having been very critical of NHS England uh, in my involvement, I do have some sympathy. And one of the issues is actually that there is such a wide view on how to manage transgender healthcare. You know, there's different philosophies. You know, should it even be involving a psychiatrist? Because it's not really a mental illness. You know, these sorts of things. And certainly some patient groups are very actively vocal about that. Um, and I think, you know, I've spoken to different people with different uh, training backgrounds. I've spoken to endocrinologists. They take it from an endocrinological point of view. And, and, and actually, because there isn't a set agreement on how best to manage this, um, that's only very hard for NHS England to then design pathways. There's not even a, an approved training program for how to become a gender specialist. So I, I, I still have some sympathy, um, but I think it shouldn't be beyond the wit to get the right people in the room to sort of thrash out some basic principles uh, involving patients, of course, in that, in that, in that journey of uh, design. Mm, mm. I mean, that probably brings us on to the next part of our conversation really nicely, actually, about what the future looks like. Um, and probably we can probably start by talking about what do what does the future of gender care services look like in the UK? I mean, Rafiq, you've already spoken about how monumental the waiting times are. And I think we can all agree that they are. It's absurd that the waiting times are as extraordinarily long as they actually are. I mean, one could come up with a very simple solution in that these clinics just need to get bigger, get more people working in them and start seeing people more quickly. But that doesn't seem to be the silver bullet solution that perhaps it might seem on the tin. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Is there any other way in which you think we should be reshaping these services? Are there any um, ideas, think, specific think, things you want to do? I think it's hard for Martha who's an ST, you know, one, two, three, in the core part of their training to gain uh, an expertise and an interest. I mean, you can, obviously, we've got the GP Plus post, they're the new concept to have a year in general practice where you can do a day a week somewhere. And that's great. But really, I think we need to tackle the post-CCT fellowship model, where, you know, that's the absolute top time for someone to create and carve out a portfolio of expertise for themselves for the rest of their sort of careers. Um, and yet no one is saying, come and come to our clinic, come and do this, you know, and, you know, it's too hard to try and design it yourself uh, and you need the funding. Oh, at the end of the day, people can't afford to go and sit in, you know, pro bono. It's just not the reality. It's not what patients deserve. They deserve a funded service and trainees to be funded to train. Um, and I think the post-CCT fellowship would be my, the, my model. And I would think the RCGP should be proposing that and talking to the GICs about how we could create that with help from Health Education England funding. Mm. I mean, Nancy, you were talking earlier about how you're involved in the reshaping of gender services in a Northern Ireland-based context. Yes. Can you well, tell us a bit more about that? Yes and no. I've probably told you as much as I'm permitted to. Okay. And that sounds so secretive, doesn't it? But this is, this is a group that has, you know, um, people with lived experience of uh, gender issues on the group. We have an, a separate entire panel of people with lived experience of gender issues. This is, this is sensitive stuff. 
And for me to say on this forum what we partially might be thinking about, which is only halfway complete, would be not appropriate. Okay. And I think that we've had to be very careful within the group of not even going home to say to spouses, this is probably what this, this is probably what it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. Because there's just so the, it, it's such an emotive topic in Northern Ireland about, well, you know, people want answers now. What's the new service going to look like? So unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to talk in any more detail. I'm sorry. Well, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. Nancy. And I think that it's um it's nice to know that those patients and those target groups have your confidence in that respect. So I think and I think I think that the word like, multi I think the word multidisciplinary is in there in a big way. It's not just going to be you know run by you know, nurses or just run by doctors or just run by psychiatrists or just run by endocrinologists. I think the word multidisciplinary is very high up there. And we're kind of trying to even bring in other uh, multidisciplinary teams, you know, occupational health, et cetera, you know, speech and language therapy. You know, I think it's, I think that would be the, the main thing to say. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the themes that we've certainly picked up on here in Liverpool and working with our other um, colleagues in different projects around the country is that we ought to be promoting a much more community led and community delivered process, um, which obviously as GPs we're very much on board with, uh, generally speaking, um, but just to even improve and and elevate the level of um, level of visibility and inclusion of the gender diverse community themselves, because um, very often um, this is a community of people who you know we have tables and rooms of people making decisions about them without having them participate in the conversations and making these decisions themselves about what the best model is for that community to meet their needs, and it can be it can be very very unfortunate that very often when one is talking about these kind of subjects is that you can be very much trapped in rooms where you're only getting cisgendered perspectives on things, which is obviously a very narrow lens through which to look at a very, very complex problem. Um, I mean, Martha, I don't know if you had any uh, particular ideas or visions about what the future might look like for gender care services, given that you are a, a keen, fresh face ST1, <laughs> given that you are interested in this area, was there a, a particular thing you thought we might need to bring about in terms of change? I, I think you've kind of picked up on it just then when um, it, it would be more of a community led service, essentially. But in saying that, like you, we've mentioned before, you need that secondary tertiary service to be able to bridge too. So as much as, as I would love to put all the focus on making more community services, making them more visible. I think we'd still need more of those secondary services in order to be able to bridge to, to refer to, to get the expert advice from. Um, or like Rafiq said, have the, the people in my position kind of who are going to come and CCT in a couple of years time to be able to do that fellowship and to become specialists ourselves, to get a special interest as well. But I think definitely in my mind I think it'd be more of a community-led focus you know people can access services quicker they can get what they need faster and 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 feel more appreciated and included kind of in the healthcare system of the UK because at the moment what's being presented um, because of chronic underfunding of the NHS and of the gender identity services is that trans healthcare is not important and doesn't seem overly important to the current government because although they've proposed to try and improve those services what's been done so far you know it's, it's difficult to find that that evidence of what's been done to this point that's kind of making me feel reassured that those services are being looked at and, and being improved mm. Adrian, I, I found this a really enlightening conversation, actually, because I've had a sort of eureka moment during it, that, <laughs> you know, GPs are absolutely bread and butter is the biopsychosocial model and all, th you know, each is a third of our job, really. Um, plus, we're community based, plus MDT working is absolutely the heart of what we do. What specialty, you know, which college would you sit gender services under? Because you're not going to have it at a, a Royal College of Gender Services. Just that's never going to happen. Mm. So a college has to take ownership and say, "We'll we'll support this." 
And I'm surprised actually now I think about it that the RCGP has never said, we, we volunteer, we think we'd be the best people to chair gender services and you know, the team, the widest team. Uh, instead, it's historically always been the Royal College of Psychiatrists, hasn't it? And, yeah. and, I, and I just think that's really interesting. Um, it's almost too obvious a solution, isn't it, Rafi? It's almost yeah, too but it's, easy. So, yeah. <laughs> so if anyone at the RCGP is listening to this, maybe they need to sort of put their head above the parapet and, and say, yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's work out what we need to have to, to change things. Yeah. And I mean, I think that that's such a, a, a wonderful vision for how things will be in the future of FEEC. I think that, you know, if we can, if we think about how gender services should work, you know, based on that holistic model of the person, of how, how this issue or this, the, their identity impacts on every single aspect of their life in a biopsychosocial way. And it seems obvious for RCGP to be the home for that for that service it does it does because you know certainly now that we've moved away from a model of gender identity disorders um, as being mental health conditions or diseases in one way or another you know it doesn't really seem appropriate for it to remain at home within the under the umbrella of um, the Royal College of Psychiatrists obviously there are certain aspects you know that impact on a person's mental health and certain things that do need some more specialist involvement but that's not true for the majority of patients that's not true in in every case certainly um yeah so i mean it's an exciting time it's an exciting area to be working in it's a, an area of dynamic and continual change and i'm sure that you know these challenges and reforms and reshaping projects will go on for many many years to come probably well beyond all of our retirements probably um, I mean looking forward to the future um, probably the final area I wanted to talk on before we draw to a close was looking at this um, LGBT action plan that Abton alluded to in his um, in his conversation and pulled up some really interesting ideas and statistics about you know about how that action plan is actually going to come into force and come into fruition um, in the primary care context. I mean, we've already talked a lot about how this is going to impact on how those objectives impact upon the uh, gender diverse, transgender, non-binary population. Um, were there any other areas that you, that it was important for us to highlight and to discuss in a bit more depth? Nancy, did you pick up on anything at all during Abton's discussion? Yeah, I was really interested about the um, Pride and Practice um, yeah stuff in in London and Manchester that Abton was talking about it, I think it's quite topical for me at the minute I'm a salary GP at the moment and um, I'm sort of reflecting on a lot of the changes that um, we're able to make within general practice tend to be really driven and led and agreed on by the GP partners and it's actually not as I'm only really now because I've been there long enough I'm really only now being listened to, I mean, our practice actually, I think, is very LGBT friendly, but it doesn't present itself um, obviously enough. So if you click on our website, to me, it should have a, a rainbow saying we're an LGBT friendly practice, but it doesn't at the moment, but I'm trying. So my point is that there are people like me who are salary GPs who maybe just don't have as much say in what happens in their practice, but they know it's the right thing to do. And then the people like Martha, who's going to be going into a surgery in a, as an ST2, who could be pointing out to them, do you know, actually, there's this uh, pride and practice thing that you could do, you know? So I'm really interested in that being a structure to it and it being evidence-based. And the fact that, um, you know, the, the statistics of the, the increased confidence in those GPs of, you know, they were so much more confident that their practice now appeared LGBT friendly, not just that they knew, well, I know that if they go and see me, that'll be nice to them and they'll be nice to them. That's not the point. It has to be obvious. Um, and the fact that the people just so much seem so much more confident to practice without risk of, uh, I think there's a fear of offence causing offence. So I'm really interested in that. And I hope that uh, we can find a way of um, accessing that in Northern Ireland. Mm. Abtin, was there any um, any um, plan or vision for Pride in Practice to expand beyond um, the major conurbations in London and Manchester? Were you aware of any plans of that nature? 
So I think the first expansion seems to have been into London over the last kind of year or two. But um, but apart from that, I think there's there's plans in the works, but I was hoping we'd have a representative from the LGBT Foundation today because it's also an area that I find really, really interesting. Um, but unfortunately, because of timings and work schedules, we weren't able to have um, anyone on this call, but I think that we will be able to find out more. And clearly there's going to be a lot of GP practices around the UK that are really interested in getting access to this. So I hope so, but I don't know if that is the case. Mm. Rafiq, were you um, aware of how this had kind of been rolled out in the London area, how this had impacted on you and your colleagues? Uh, I mean, I, I think Prime Pratt's fantastic, and you know, in its infancy, I you know, I worked a lot with with the, the foundation, and but I do think you know, I'm I'm a GP partner, Nancy, and you know, my practice hasn't done Pride in practice. Now, you know, I and I, I don't say that. I, I hope people don't judge me as a hypocrite, but the reason is because there are so many other competing interests on on, on what's going on, and and. Um, and I so I, to be honest, I feel that Pride in Practice personally is is very ambitious to devote a lot of time to this. Um, but I and I actually think if everyone if you can always make it too hard, you can you can actually make it so that you then think oh it's too much, it's overwhelming. I'm just not going to do it at all. And I do think you know small steps, uh, you know, making it easier actually to do the right thing. So if there were just five points that a practice could do instantly within a partner's meeting they could say right we'll do this 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 and this i think that would probably achieve more than a big program of of, of organizational change um, although of course the value of that organization one of the biggest things that pilot practice does is it encourages team discussions around lgbt matters so you know everyone from the partners receptionists everyone are on the same page and get to share their anxieties and support each other working through an improvement plan but I, I, that's my, my issue with, with prime practice. And I think as a result, it hasn't had the impact I think it could have. And um, that would be my critical view. Um, I think one of the things in the action plan that interested me, Anton, was this, um, you know, and I've been working on this, is sexual orientation monitoring. And, and I think we still are in a bit, a complete mess because we don't know what we're doing. This yeah. sexual orientation monitoring is about having the data to be able to commission services appropriate to LGBT people's needs. And it is separate to a patient coming out to you in a consultation. And we have to work out these differences. And we also have to work out what labels are the correct labels. Because when you do a monitoring exercise, it was the same when we did race in the 1950s and 60s, 70s. You know, there was a real backlash of, I don't want to have to label myself as black. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, what is the correct label for people? And how do you self-determine yourself? And I don't think we've even got that right. I mean, I was on a committee for a whole bloody year on this, and we couldn't work it out. Um, and particularly, it gets much more difficult with non-binary stuff, you know, where there's so many different terms. Um, so I think, but but we need to work on monitoring. And it's a sad reality that the vast majority of practices in Britain are not doing sexual orientation monitoring. Yet we think it's perfectly okay to ask someone their race. Hmm. Um, and that data, until we get that data, we're not going to be able to improve services and commission the right sort of services for, for, for the patients that we serve. Um, but it, the, the final thing I just wanted to mention is, you know, one of the dangers of being an open and accepting practice is that when patients do disclose things like their sexual orientation in a consultation, is that need to repeatedly come out or the assumption that they don't need to do that because we're such a great practice. It would, everyone should know. And patients mm. will, of course, only tell us what they think is relevant. And uh, sometimes they don't realize that it might be very relevant to know someone's sexual orientation or gender at the time of birth, whatever it may be. Um, so I, I think uh, of the action plan, the one that we really need to put some attention to is how we record the data, how we use the data and make that clear to patients so that they get the care they deserve. It's a really um, fascinating topic, Rafiq, in that, you know, GPs, I think, I suppose nationally, but certainly here in Northern Ireland, occasionally come across the read term homosexuality that we have to delete from the patient record and then put a note in 
the patient record to say we deleted a patient record because it was completely inappropriate for these reasons. You know, so it, it, it's when we're dealing with um, data on these big computer systems, it, it, it sound your your committee did sound a bit nightmarish. And that sounds well, full. That's full circle, Nancy, to what Abton presented in his talk. Because by deleting that term, that might be the term that was put in when they were abused by the health service dealing with them 20 years ago. And are you, is it right to delete history? I mean, obviously, patients should have a say, but it's interesting we automatically assume it should be deleted yeah, because it was used as an ICD-10 classification yeah. in a pathological way. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, where do you put that data? No one really knows at the moment. But it might so, not, but actually in the 80s, it might not have been um, done in an ill will. It might have been done so that they remember that this patient's gay next time they come in. It's, it really is a minefield. Yeah, I guess that kind of chimes in with another point that um, Abton raised in his discussion, which I thought was very interesting, um, about how um, a certain proportion of LGBT patients were satisfied or dissatisfied about being referred to LGBT specific or specialist organizations and services and obviously for transgender patients it's quite clear what those services might well be but um, it was quite difficult to get a grip of what does that mean like for me as a gay man going into my GP surgery what sort of services might you even plan referring me to um, that might be of relevant sort of any help to me um, and I suppose that kind of chimes in with the idea of keeping record of this stuff like if we don't know that I don't know eight percent of the patients that we look after are LG or B or T um, if we don't know that then how on earth can we be involved as stakeholders in conversations about bidding for services for those people if we're not counting who they are and where they are um, so surely that's something we need to we need to get a grip of, don't we? We need to know what we're measuring and how we're going to measure it, um, which I think is probably a, a, a work in progress to say the very least, yeah? Martha, was this, um, was this anything that's coming up on, for you as a trainee um, about how to communicate these sort of issues or how to navigate these type of consultations with people about how to highlight or flag up or recognize or mark what a patient's sexual orientation is is that is that something that's coming up in your training um not for me so far because i've mainly been hospital based during this year so i suppose when i'm doing like i said doing a bit more gp during my gpft2 then i imagine this will come up during some training or it obviously will come up during consultations with patients as well mm. and when i was watching the presentation you're kind of thinking about how how would I go about kind of dealing with this kind of consultation and thinking from a personal perspective as well? Would I appreciate someone kind of openly asking me what my sexual orientation was, asking me what my pronouns were, you know, and just being quite forward with those questions? And I think probably I would not mind that because like we just touched on, you, you're not kind of having to repeatedly out yourself during each consultation. But then, like we mentioned just now, is it relevant to know that during every consultation? Probably not. Um, so it's difficult to know when you would want to ask those questions. Would it be based on what the patient is presenting with, whether you thought it was relevant? And, and yeah, where do, where do we how do we collect this data and where do we store it once we have it? Is it just kind of to, to see the proportion of patients in our practice or are we putting that alongside the patient uh, notes and things so that it's a reminder there for us that we can, that we should be aware of that patient's sexual orientation or, um, or a change in pronouns or their trans status. I, I don't know. It's really difficult. Like we said, it's a bit of a minefield on how we kind of deal with this topic. Yeah, I think it is a challenging area. There's no doubt about that. But I think this is about um, elevating the level of these conversations from mm. the basic generic conversational politeness of how to speak to an LGBT person versus how do we as expert generalists, as GPs, address the known health disparities that exist within LGBTQ populations? Because we know that these things exist. Um, we know that lesbian women 
um, have difficulties or challenges or barriers with regard to accessing cervical screening for a whole host of different reasons. Um, and if we don't know what proportion of lesbian women we have in our practice, how do we know, how do we best tailor our public health messaging as a practice? Just to take one example, you know, or if we're, yeah. if we're working in an area that is massively overrepresentative of um, with um, men who have sex with men, gay and bisexual men, um, do we need to be doing more to promote access to relevant types of sexual health screening or PrEP or whatever else, you know? Um, and I think that if we don't even know where we're starting from, we know what number of these patients are we looking after. If we don't even know how to ask the questions, um, <laughs> we're not going to get very far, are we? Sorry, Rafi, you were trying to sorry, say something. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just, I, 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 just another example that people don't think about for, for gay men, you know, they, they should be offered the hepatitis uh, vaccination programme. Um, and, you know, you know, every other vaccination programme, we proactively recall patients, don't we? For shingles, we do it. Yet mm. for something like hepatitis, we don't. Because we don't have a clue who to invite specifically because they might be at risk. Uh, and I, you know, I think, you know, and, the, and you know, somehow that's okay. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's really, you know, big, a big issue. And, and I think um, how I, I just wanted to share an anecdote that just, you know, to this day sits with me of, you know, domestic violence, you know, affecting people and how difficult it can be, um, you know, uh, as a gay man. Um, I, I had a patient who was depressed, had seen GP after GP, was on all the antidepressants, had been referred to psychiatry because they sort of tried to hurt themselves. Um, and one day they say, came to see me and I saw them look at my rainbow flag mouse mat. And they looked at it a couple of times and then they caught my eye look, seeing all of this. And there was some weird moment in the consultation. And I, I realized I, that they'd used a sort of gender neutral pronoun about a partner. And I just said, who is your partner? Let's let's just unpick this a bit more. Let me I, and and because they, I think there'd been a moment of trust had been established through through what had happened in the sixth sense of this consultation. They then disclosed they'd been beaten up by their partner for years and had never told anyone because they felt that it was de um, demasculate, uh, mas you know, it was emasculating as a man to admit that you've been beaten up by uh, uh, a person, uh, another man. Um, so, you know, it's something as simple as that, um, but I don't have a clue how much domestic violence is going on for, for people and how do I refer them to the appropriate services? And that's the, the final thing you were asking about appropriate services. At the moment, it's all about third sector and knowing what the charities are around you. Um, uh, and, you know, I just don't understand how that's acceptable in any other part of the health service. You would, you would absolutely have pathways in place to know immediately what to do in certain circumstances but we don't really look at that it's all done on a kind of charitable basis and you happen to know there's a charity you have to google it almost during a consultation yeah yeah right well i mean there's so many more avenues we could go down um for this conversation and um, so many other things we could touch on um, thank you so much, Abtin, for your presentation. It certainly provokes a whole lot of very, very interesting conversations, and I'm sure we could go on for, for many, many hours, but I think we're going to have to draw it to a close there for today. So um, thank you so much to Abtin primarily for his wonderful presentation at the beginning, and thank you to everybody who's taking the time to contribute to today's panel. It's been um, very, very useful. And I hope that everyone who's watched has uh, enjoyed the conversation and has learned something from it. And it's perhaps prompted you to go off and research and do your bit of own bit of learning and further education. Um, if you'd like to get involved in any further way in our L RCGP Pride season or the activities of the LGBTQ plus steering group or whatever else, you'll find the interest form link in the description below. Um, along with some other websites and contact information for other organisations that we might have mentioned today or that might otherwise be helpful to those who are looking for more resources in this sort of area. Um, so thank you very much. Um, take care and uh, happy Pride Month.